So I'm Teresa Wellman with Homeowner Experience Real Estate, and today we're coming together with a few different experts to talk through moving and planning for your retirement and what might make sense for you. We'll go through a couple different scenarios that we've all helped with and give you some tips and tricks. And if you've got any questions, feel free to record those and we'll or write those down and we'll address the questions at the end. So I've been a realtor since 2005, and I'll introduce myself a little bit more um, as we get to my speaking portion. But I've helped a lot of people transition from, you know, a home they've been in for 30, 40 years into somewhere that they plan to live um, their retirement years. And in those years, I've gathered several different resources and people that have been able to help and assist my clients in the process. So that's kind of the point today is to pull all of those resources together to give you more information to help in your planning phase. So we're going to start off with Kate, and Kate is with Project Clutter, and she'll go ahead and introduce herself. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm Kate Souza, and I'm with Project Clutter. I have been um, helping people downsize and relocate in the Bay Area since 2013. So um, a little bit about me. I have 25 moves personally under my belt. I grew up as um, in the military uh, as a dependent and then as a wife. Um, so I moved in several phases of my life. Um, in 2012, I moved to the Bay Area with the, um, with the goal of becoming a professional organizer and helping people with overwhelming clutter. And then I realized how much um, that ties, would tie into some relocation assistance. And so, I've been fortunate enough to work with some amazing real estate agents in the area and Teresa's pulled me in on several of her projects over the last few years and um, it's been a joy to help people here in the Bay Area. Um, there's so many rich wonderful stories of, of people and their lives and so um, you know usually people call me when they are looking to transition or um, change up some things. And sometimes that means um, a move locally. And sometimes that means a move out of state. So just like, um, you know, every move has its own uh, set of variables that are going to come with it. But once we go um, and, and make that first uh, meeting, usually my question is, what are you taking? So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, I think here. Um, let's see. So I'm got a flyer here that I'm going to share, and I'll just go through kind of some of the points in that. Sorry, um, it's coming. Okay, and then second up till the. There we go. Yep. Okay. So um, usually, people when people call me and they they let me know that they're looking to move, I. I would like to know what what their time frame is because you know, as many of you know, um, you may have been in your house for several decades, um, it tends to be the common uh, theme with people in the area. And so that stuff does not get accumulated overnight and we might need a little bit of time. So hopefully you reach out to someone like myself um, in the pre-contemplation or early stages of your, or of your moving um, planning. And um, whenever I am on site, you know, you walk in and you you see the people with in their home, and you ask, "Hey, what are you what are you looking at taking? You know, are you, is this a downsize? How are we gonna how are we gonna do this?" And so, you know, some people have a very quick answer, and they say, "Oh, all of it goes. Not really downsizing. I'm just relocating, and I'm taking my stuff with me." Um, another very common answer is, "None of it goes," and that's pretty easy. And none of it goes still requires a little bit of logistical. Uh, support, but not as much as the some of it goes. And so when someone says, well, some of it's going, that's where I have to dig in and roll up my sleeves. And we have to come up with a strategy on how we're going to make that happen. So um, I usually recommend that we take a site survey about that time and just kind of walk around and get reacclimated and familiar with some of the things in our houses, because as you all know, we tend to store stuff and sock things away in little nicks and crannies throughout the entire T of our home, like turtles, we can spread to fill up our cage. And so as we walk around and do a site survey, we can begin to 
get a, a rough idea of some of the things. And usually people will begin to point out in that process, oh yeah, I'm not taking that or I'm taking this, or I really need to go through that. And so walking around doing a site survey and taking some notes um, is a really great first step. And it doesn't take long to do, but sometimes you do need someone else with you to hold your hand and walk you through the, the process because there's usually some questions that might come up, you know, and as well as someone with an eye like mine who has helped people relocate, there's certain pieces of furniture or, or things that might need some additional um, logistical support. For instance, you know, a baby, a grand piano or something like that. If that's going, we might need to get a specialty move or some heavy piece of equipment or, or furniture. Um, so that process is fun. And usually we kind of get a, a rough idea of what, what you're gonna, you know, how we're gonna need to address a few things. And um, I also have recommended and passed to many of my clients to do what I call a sticker exercise. And it's, it's very easy, it's very simple. At Home Depot, they sell a pack of stickers that has red, blue, um, green, yellow stickers in them. And those can go on and, and identify things. I tell people red is something we don't wanna take with us. It's kind of like a stop sign. Um, yellow is something that usually people are, there's some caution there. Maybe you want to, um, take a little bit of time or revisit that and green means it's going to go with you. And that just helps people walk through and identify and make those, um, decisions. And then you can kind of step away knowing like, okay, I communicated that that is something that, that I have made a decision on because in this process, there's a lot of decisions to be made. <laughs> so it, it really helps. Um, and then again, another piece that kind of comes out of that is identifying the resources that you may need to pull in. So I've listed some standard resources that tend to come into the move management and the project management aspect of things. And Teresa will have a much more in-depth um, list of some of that. Um, but this is kind of pretty standard for anyone that's doing move management or downsizing. Um, it, depending on what you have and what, what you're willing to, to put into the project. Um, you know, you may want to outsource a, a tremendous amount to somebody, to a moving and packing service, or you may wanna bring in your friends and family. So it just really depends on what resources you have available and, and the time frame that you're looking at. So um, in that period of time, uh, when you're when you're kind of bringing together the things that you may need and making phone calls and doing some research. That is where you can begin to take some downtime, you know, when you're spending the, the evening watching something on TV or um, maybe a weekend or whatnot and doing a little bit of a uh, rough sort and purge through some of the items and places in your house that are more personal um, and something that's less easy to delegate. So. I recommend people dealing with their paperwork during this time frame, kind of getting that under control, um, you know, getting things sh sorted to shred and um, things, you know, collecting up your very personal and, and very important paperwork. Um, that usually takes a, a, some time. So one box at a time in front of the TV with your shredder or, um, you know, uh, um, when you're watching the evening news or whatever shows you like, and, and that'll really help um, cut down on some of that to-do list because uh, unfortunately we kind of tend to collect paper on a, on a very large scale, especially when we have a lifetime of work that we've, we've uh, brought into our home. And, and, and so paperwork underneath your, your sinks, um, cosmetics, you know, medicine cabinets, all that stuff can be, you know, purged in the early stages and you're gonna feel better getting rid of a, a tube of hydrocortisone cream from 1998 or something, you know? So those are the things that help um, just start the process. It gets you, get your gears moving. Um, and, and, you know, once you kind of do address some of those areas, you can move on to some areas that need a little bit more intensive um, sorting. And, and that's where calling in maybe somebody who does professional organizing or move management might be able to help, um, you know, spend some time doing some sorting. Um, garages are a great place to start. I highly recommend um, 
people looking at their garage as a as a as a kind of a first pass because it does two things it helps clear up um, space and usually a lot of things that we're really not using go to our garages to retire and so um, making that space for um, for other things to get brought out to the garage um, you know and and and, and left until the move happens. So it helps the, the, you know, pre-stage declutter is what I call it. So when you pack up some of the, you know, precious items or your knickknacks or, you know, um, some office work or whatever that you want to take with you. A lot of guys like their um, electronics in this area. So, you know, they might've purged some stuff, but still have some boxes they're taken. Those things can then be brought out to the garage and set in an area. So that pre-pack, um, pre-stage declutter, um, is really, is really a good time to, to cut out some of the stuff in your home. And then it helps, you know, once you bring in a real estate agent that wants to, <laughs> to talk about a timeline and stuff. And if you've got some of your more personal things kind of pulled down and, and, and packed away that are non-essential and, um, it just helps streamline that process and fast track things a little bit better. But, um, if you scoot on down this, let me see, um, I've got some moving supplies that I recommend people kind of bring in as they're as they might start going through their things. And really, um, I've been helping people sort through their things for so long now. Um, one thing that never changes is other people get worried about people touching their things. So if you're at home um, and you're you're gonna work on stuff, focus on your things. Um, if you bring somebody in to help you use your day to work with them, if they need to work with your wife or your husband, um, schedule another day for that. I don't always recommend husbands and wives working on projects together, but um, when you have a home and you're trying to, to work um, on you know um, a common goal of getting out, then everybody does have to do a little bit. And you know, there's some extenuating circumstances that come um, up in different um, and different clients have different needs. So it's really, really important to talk to somebody that might help you strategize on on what steps to take, how best to, um, you know, begin the process. Um, but if you even wanted to just take this list and start implementing some things that there's nothing backwards in those steps as far as getting the decisions going and, and, and thinking about what you're going to need resource wise. And I wish that I could get in front of everybody before they reach out to a real estate agent and kind of give this, um, give this information out and, and encourage, you know, as much as possible for people to start as soon as possible, as soon as they can. I mean, um, and it, it may be just a really powerful spring cleaning event that you take, you know, um, seriously, but it's uh it's gonna help you in the long run. Um, I definitely recommend um, you know with with a with an with a local moving company um, getting getting a couple of estimates on what that would look like, and then out of state moves are um, a little bit logistically different. Um, and there are some companies that do pick up locally and carry door to door. Um, and just you want to make sure that you're asking some some pretty streamlined questions about that if they're brokers or or if they're um, and they're going to pass off your load to different things. Um, you just really want to make sure that you're looking into that moving company. But moving is exciting. And, um, you know, hopefully this team will help answer some additional questions for you. And I know that my piece is um, is one that has just a variety of, of circumstances. So I'm completely open to questions or recommendations at the end. Um, I, I, uh, I'm just here for a resource for anything specific to what you may have question wise, because there's a strong possibility I have encountered something that it, someone in this room might have as a question. <laughs> but um, I thank you for your time. And thanks, Teresa. I'll go ahead and hand back yeah. to you. Okay, you can stop sharing your screen, Kate, and then we'll have Scott come forward. So Scott's going to talk through a few different scenarios in regards to planning the financial aspect of your move and some things to be aware of. So Scott, you want to introduce yourself? 
Yeah, perfect. Thanks. And thanks for sharing, Kate. I know we'll have some questions for you at the end, so that'll be good. Uh, my name is Scott Perring. I am the CEO of Seek First. We are a comprehensive tax and financial planning firm based in San Jose here. We also have an office in LA and have been doing that since 2010, serving families. So when Teresa and I, I think this is our third um, seminar together, Teresa and Kate. And last year when we were brainstorming this, we thought, what are the questions that we get regularly? You know, a lot of people are downsizing these days. A lot of people are moving. A lot of baby boomers are planning for their next chapter. So we thought, hey, let's pull this together, uh, offer some resources, answer some questions, and we think it'll be a, a needed topic. So I hope this is informative for you guys. Um, I'll share two real stories of folks that have come to me. They approached me early on in our process about potentially moving. And they had a lot of tax and financial questions. You know, the first story is about Jeff and Michelle. They were actually here in the San Jose area. And this was uh, late last year. And they thought they'd stay here forever. You know, they lived in their house in Campbell here for over 30 years. They raised their kids here. Their community and their church was here. And then their kids moved away after college. And it was kind of funny because they didn't think they would follow the kids. But they both ended up in Texas. They have a son and a daughter, and they both ended up in Texas. They both got married in the last five years, and their daughter was pregnant. So that was like the last straw. Michelle's like, I'm ready to go. Let's do it. Jeff's job was remote now after COVID. So he approached his employer. He got the green light to move to Texas. And they said, we're doing this. So they come in in our process. We pull everything from them, you know, what's important, what their goals are. And they said, we want to move, you know, soon this year in the next about six months. So one of our resources is we can run the full tax projection for them and have a proactive strategy to minimize the taxes that will be owed. So I'll show you the, their actual projection here. And let me share this and I'll, I'll talk you through the details just to put some real specifics for this for you as it might be relevant. So this is Jeff and Michelle moving to Texas. They sold their house for 1.8 million. Okay, so we ran this on the front end at, with the anticipated sales price, and then we recalculated it when it was a little different. They got about ask, but right at 1.8 million, they've only paid 297,000 for their house. Okay, I think they were in their 28 years in Campbell, and you know, it it appreciated quite well. So <laughs> they paid 297,000. They pulled. Um, selling expenses out of that. So real estate commissions and closing costs and escrow and title and insurance and all that. So that was about 7%, another 126 grand. And then we helped them dig up as many capital improvements as possible. So as you guys probably know, any capital improvements to your home are not taxed. They add to the basis, add to what you purchased from it. And we help them get as comprehensive as possible in, in this. So I actually have this next sheet that I'll show you too that shows what counts as a capital improvement because it's a little bit of a gray area and the IRS does not have an exhaustive list on what counts as capital improvements. But there are some rules of thumbs and the big differences between capital improvements and repairs. And, you know, repairs don't count. Those don't get added to your cost basis. Capital improvements do. So the definition of a capital improvement is anything that adds value to your home, prolongs its life, or adapts it for new uses. There's no exhaustive list, as I mentioned, but examples are any additions, swimming pools, new roofs, new HVAC system, water heaters, upgrading your windows to, you know, storm windows, intercom systems, home security systems, anything that adds to, you know, the capital, the asset of the home counts. And there's also certain energy saving home improvements that also have tax credits. Many of you know, solar has been a big deal and there's a big tax credit for that, that some families have taken advantage of. So capital improvements counts. What don't count are any repairs. So things like fixing things, you know, fixing a gutter, painting a room, replacing a window pane, ongoing maintenance, obviously housekeeping, land, landscaper services do not count. Now, landscaping in the backyard would count, right? So if you put in pavers or a deck or new concrete or turf or 
flowers or you know any landscaping like that that counts but repairs don't <laughs> excuse me so working with jeff and michelle we were able to create a spreadsheet for them because they did not have the best records so you know believe it or not 28 years raising their family there it was never a priority to chronicle every year how much they spent in these different projects and you don't get a tax deduction when you spend it so it's easy to kind of get a little lazy or sloppy on the record keeping because it's only going to be relevant when you sell. And frankly, they never thought they were going to sell. So we had this long conversation. It's like, all right, you bought it 28 years ago. Tell me about any improvements. We're making the sheet for them. And then we went room by room and it stirred up new memories. And they even tried to find pictures from the past. It's like, oh yeah, in the kitchen, we redid the countertops. You know, in, in our son's room, we... What did they do in there? I think there was an AC issue that was related to that room. And we went room by room and added it all up. And then they had some invoices and other otherwise we estimated, you know, a fair, you know, fair market value above board estimate on what it could be. And we got to this number of 154,000. So that's capital improvements. I can answer any questions about that at the end. But that comes off the top, which is great. So their total gain is 1.22 million. And they get a capital gain exclusion of 500,000 because it's their primary home and they've lived there, you know, two out of the last uh, five years. So their taxable gain was 723,000. Now it's not so straightforward on exactly how much tax is due on that because it depends on your other income sources and what tax bracket you're at the year you sell, right? And of course the IRS or Franchise Tax Board do not make it an easy calculation there's two types of federal tax. There's capital gains tax. Some is at 0%, some's at 15%, some's at 20%. Okay, so all in for them, it was 130 grand. There's the net investment tax of 3.8% that qualified for them. That's another 13K they had to pay. California, they were at the 9.3% state tax rate. So that was 67 grand. And then there's a 1% mental health services tax because they're at a higher income bracket too. So that was another 1,800. So all in, they paid 212,000 in tax. So in sales proceeds here, if you track this, they sold it for 1.8, they paid the 212 in tax. That tax isn't due till next April. So they were able to delay it a little bit, but we set it aside in escrow. They paid 126,000 in selling expenses and they had a mortgage. So they had refied, I think, twice to help send their kids to college. It was, you know, it wasn't plan A, but it's what happened with them. So they had a larger mortgage. Um, they told me how embarrassing it was that they bought the house for two ninety seven, and you know, twenty eight years later, they owe almost double that. But you know, life kind of happened, and expenses went up, and that's what they used to leverage. So they had their mortgage. So they had their proceeds of nine hundred forty k. OK, their vision for their Texas home was to spend between 800 and 950 all in. So they ended up spending about 750 on the home, but there's a number of projects they wanted to do on it. So now they have another 150 K that's set aside over this next year to do some additions. They want to upgrade the kitchen and some landscaping work. So the point is that was plenty of money to buy their home and it was kind of an even exchange, right? They downsized, they paid the tax, so they didn't have the pending capital gains for them and they were able to get what they want. But there's many considerations. So for Jeff and Michelle, they were on track financially that an even exchange for their house, you know, their proceeds, dumping that to the new property worked out. But that's not always the case. So there's many considerations such as what do they do with the sale proceeds? Some folks need to use it for retirement, kind of catch up from some lack of savings in the past. Um, and then there's calculations for the new property. Do you pay cash or do you get a mortgage? You know, sometimes it makes sense to pay cash. Sometimes it can make sense to pay a mortgage, especially if they're still working and they can get a favorable interest rates. You know, interest rates are a little tougher now, but, you know, a year ago it was pretty different. And then they have this question of the new budget at their new location, meaning what's their monthly nut? You know, how much do they spend day to day just to run their life in Texas versus in California? And we have this nice spreadsheet showing all the different types of tax, you know, 
property tax and sales tax and excise tax and insurance premiums and cost of living and state tax. You know, they don't have a state tax in Texas, but some other taxes are, are higher. So we're able to show them, you know, net, net, their, their cost of living for them is about three to 5% lower than it is in California. So it's significant, but it wasn't as monumental as they thought. And there you go, the new budget and including all the different types of taxes that they don't see. So summary is they came in, we ran all this for them, and then they moved quickly. <laughs> Once they felt like they got the green line from us that, you know, taxes won't be the end of the world. It's 200K coming off the top. They're still going to have over 900K for the new property. They moved pretty quickly on that other end to find to find a property. And it only took, I think, two and a half months. It was their second offer in Texas and it got accepted and they're, they're well on their way. And I met with them recently and I asked if they looked back at all or regret anything. And it was like, you know, no, no, no. Everything's peachy. We're with the granddaughter and our son and our daughter and uh, they're in a really good spot. So it was just, you know, a blessing to serve them and walk with them through that, through a process that was a little bit hairier than, than they thought initially. So that's the Jeff and Michelle story. I have one more story for you and it's about Rick and Karen. So this was a helping mom downsize story. So Rick and Karen are up here in Northern California. Their mom, Rick's mom lived in Santa Clara and she did not own a home. So she's widowed. She lives on a pension or husband's pension and some social security money. And she's in her mid eighties. And Rick and Karen came in a bit over a year ago and they had their retirement planned out and their goals, but the elephant in the room was who's going to take care of mom. So Rick explained to me that uh, he has one sister and Rick's the more financially capable sibling and mom is starting to lose her faculties. So it was a, wow, let's look at this scenario because what if she needs to go into one of these homes? She's renting a place right now with no care, but if she needs to go into these homes and it's, you know, six or 8,000 or 10,000 or 12,000 a month, Rick's going to be the one paying for that. And how bad is that going to affect Rick and Karen's plans, their plans for their golden years? And, you know, Karen is a strong woman. She's kind, but she's also direct. So in the first meeting, she's like, you know, let's just get this on the table. This is the elephant in the room, Rim, Rick, because, you know, I love your mom, but if we have to take care of her, how bad is this going to screw up our future? You know, this was not plan A. And unfortunately, mom was not in a position to have resources or sell a home or have long-term care insurance or any of that. It, it's going to come from Rick. So we ran all the numbers, similar calculation, kind of best case scenario, worst case scenario, and then somewhere in the middle. And it turns out they'll be okay. They will need to trim their lifestyle a little bit, depending on how bad mom's care gets. They know she's going to need to enter a facility here pretty soon. And, you know, the facilities start, they start at stage one for, you know, a lower premium, but then there's a different floor for the memory unit and the hospice unit. And, you know, it might get accelerated after that. So we kind of ran all those scenarios, but they're going to be fine. They might need to trim a little bit, but I can't tell you how much of a relief it was for Karen to know that, you know, worst case scenario, her mother-in-law goes in the home. It takes, you know, seven or eight years for her to run her course and they're still going to be fine. They're Rick's 56. So their fifties and their sixties and their seventies should still be in a good spot. So that was just really gratifying to me to help make that difference. Cause they were, they were worked up over it. And again, kind of the relational dynamics with, you know, I love your mom, but you know, what's happening here. How is this all falling on us? was a big deal. So just getting all that on paper and smoothing it out was, was a big win for them. So those are my two stories, uh, Jeff and Michelle and Rick and Karen. Happy to answer any questions towards the end or address specific situations, but those are two recent stories that I thought might resonate uh, about downsizing and moving. Thank you, Scott, for sharing. I appreciate that. Yeah. Perfect. So I'm going to jump in and share some scenarios uh, similar to Scott, two different stories of couples that I have helped make a move and kind of their timelines and the process they went through. So I'll go ahead and share my screen as well so that um, we can see those in more detail. 
Okay, so can you see my screen? Okay, so first story is Bruce and Cassie. Bruce and Cassie had been working a lot and actually Bruce was retired, but Cassie was still working. And Bruce, <laughs> Bruce wanted to, to have fun with Cassie. He's like, she needs to stop working. I need to get her out of this intense environment. It's time to move. They went to go visit some friends in Florida and fell in love with the area that their friends lived and decided, you know what, this is where we're going. If we sell our house, we're going to be in a really good situation to move to Florida and Cassie won't have to work anymore and we can enjoy life. So they called me all of a sudden because they went to Florida and got really excited and said, we need to move in a month or two. We found a house. We were excited about Florida. We're in contract on a house. Get us there fast. <laughs> so this was a very quick um, scenario. They ended up moving to a 55 plus active adult community. They were in their early 60s, so really early on, but they loved the activities of it. So we had to quickly purge um, their, they did well, they didn't have help with Kate, but they got some dumpsters and dumped a lot of things since they were moving completely across the country, minimize their personal property, uh, did the prepacking in the garage like Kate suggested of first getting the garage cleaned out and then moving a whole bunch into the garage, deciding what they were taking. And then we prepped their home for sale. They needed new carpet. They'd been there 35 years, had raised children, had, had family staying there, had pets. It, it, it was time. So we got new carpet in, full interior, exterior paints. We did handyman repairs. They had broken a broken window and a couple other things that needed to be dealt with. And then a landscape cleanup um, mulch and just trimming of things to make it look picture perfect. So that all in total took a month. So it was a really fast race for them, but they did it. They had some late nights and they were, but they were committed to their schedule. So they wanted to make it happen. And then in, and, and I, I guess I should say they did it all on their own. They didn't, not the, the home prep, but the packing and the purging, they did on their own. So they didn't have help, which was a little intense, but they did it. Um, and then in one week we had the property staged and photographed and got all the marketing ready. And then it was put on the market. We had an offer in about 10 days, actually we had multiple offers in that scenario. They had a 30 day escrow and then we were able to negotiate three weeks of rent back for them because the house that they had bought in Florida had a similar situation where the seller needed to go make another purchase. So they had asked to stay over. So there was a longer timeline there that we you know, negotiated and made the transition easier for them here so that they could move once and move from point A to point B and not be stuck somewhere in the middle. Now, Gary and Marlene, um, their whole goal was to move closer to family. They had children that moved in Santa Cruz and they were getting um, up in their years in their late seventies and they were not interested in driving over 17 anymore. So they thought we need to be closer where we can have a quick drive to see our children and our grandchildren. And so they took longer because they had been in their home 42 years and it, it was a very emotional process for them to go through all of their items. So they took it at their pace. They took six months to slowly move through. They pre-packed things in a pod that they knew they were keeping and did a lot of donating and purging to be focused on not taking things that they knew they didn't want to keep. It didn't make sense to move for them. And their scenario was a little different in that they had a place to stay interim. So they wanted to sell their home and know how much they could get for their home before they made a purchase. And so they completely moved and got it ready and then um, stayed in. They had a, um, a family home that they were able to stay in for a couple of months while they shopped for the new one. So after the six months of prep, a similar timeline within one week, we had staging and photography done. Um, in less than two weeks, we had offers on their property. They had a 30 day escrow and they moved five days before escrow closed because they had that um, family home option to move to for a while. So those are kind of, to give you a different timeline, we see sometimes people actually contact me a year ahead and we start strategizing and setting up a plan and calendar to give them six months to purge and plan and then work on projects slowly on their house rather than trying to cram it all really within a month or two. Uh, so that's helpful for some people. So it really just depends on your scenario and your plan and your timeline. And then, you know, in these situations, both, both of them moved kind of out of the area. Um, Gary and Marlene moving just to Santa Cruz. Uh, we were able to connect them with an agent that I knew over there. 
Uh, moving to Florida, they had already figured that out and bought their house before they even called me. So, you know, I do have people who move within the area. They downsize, they move to different communities. They go from a tri-level home. A story that I didn't share is Linda and Angel. They lived in Almaden Valley in a tri-level home. Linda had been having trouble with her hip and decided I've got to get out of these stairs before they become an issue. She needed to have surgery and she didn't want to deal with the stairs during her surgery. So they ended up buying a single story home in Blossom Valley. And then she was able to settle in and then have her surgery and heal and not have to worry about the stairs. So a lot of different scenarios. But if you're considering staying really anywhere, I mean, there's a lot of options to think about. You know, do you want to move to a single story home? Do you want to move somewhere that's smaller, that fits your financial budget, like a condo or a townhome that then you can travel and enjoy some of those retirement funds rather than putting it all in a house? So it really depends. And that's where Scott kind of will can help you talk through your goals and what you want to do and then figure out what's the right scenario for you. There, of course, is 55 plus active communities here in San Jose. The Villages is one of the really popular ones in um, the East Foothills. There's a condo community in Los Gatos that's walking distance to downtown that um, is nice if you're interested in a condo. There's a lot of communities in Morgan Hill and Gilroy that are single family, but just smaller to most of them are two bedroom, two bath houses for downsizing. Um, and then you can obviously go out of the area a little bit to Brentwood, Lincoln, you know, so anywhere up north as some more options. And what other favorite I find is a small like two bedroom home in Willow Glen that's walking distance to downtown that also becomes really popular with some people that I've worked with. They just want to simplify their life and be able to walk and do more and just have a smaller piece of property to care for. So, you know, if you have any further questions, of course, you can reach out and we'll open up the discussion now. I'll stop sharing my screen so that if you have a question, um, if you know how to raise your hand on the screen, you can do that. If not, just speak up and, um, you know, open, turn off your or unmute yourself and speak up and then we can address questions. And maybe call out who your, uh, if, if your question is directed to one person in particular, Scott, Kate, or I, let, let us know. Oh, David, David's got his hand up. He's a pro. <laughs> David, <laughs> what's your question? <laughs> First of all, thanks, Tisha. First of all, uh, thanks, Teresa, Scott, and Kate. Um, this is really uh, informative and things that, you know, you don't always take into account or you don't know. So it's nice to be able to get this overview in each of the different areas. So thanks for taking the time. I have a question, uh, a couple of questions. Number one is uh, for Kate. Um, Kate, one of the challenges in trying to do the, um, the purging, right, is over the years, of course, I've accumulated a lot my own personal items. Um, but then I've also accumulated, uh, you know, the prized possessions from mom and dad when they've <laughs> passed, right? And so what I find to be really challenging, I'm interested in, in your approach to this and your thoughts, is, you know, getting rid of the things that I have is by comparison much easier than getting rid of the, or at least this is what I find, than getting rid of the sentimental things that belong to mom and dad, even if it doesn't make sense around those sentimental things like uh, pieces of paper or, you know, photographs, of course, you would uh, end up keeping uh, most of the time. But the, how do you deal with the making the decision between the sentimental things that may not make any sense, but there's an emotional attachment to them versus those things that you can easily purge. Do you have a comment on that? Kate, you're muted. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, great question. Um, that's what I like to call inherited clutter. And um, <laughs> there's so much of that, um, especially, um, especially when people who are trying to downsize themselves and, you know, they're, they're like, oh man, I've, I've I've got this collection of things that um, I am not a strong arm person when it comes to getting rid of things. I would never tell someone to get rid of something that they felt was special or really held some value to their lives or, or another family member. Um, if it's something that you have decided that you that, that, that you're ready to let go of, you know, I don't know, some people have other family members that they can reach out to and kind of put it up as like, Hey, you know, first pass, um, here's some things that I'd like to, you know, uh, distribute throughout the family. 
um, you know, let me know if you're interested. Um, some people have some really amazing stuff that, that they may want to reach out to different, um, organizations or agencies that, that might, you know, preserve those things. I, I, I went to the museums in, in DC and stuff this week. So I like, I saw what the people put in things. And some people have a really interesting collection of historical things that, you know, I, I just don't, I don't encourage people to necessarily just, you know, throw out, um, you know, you, you definitely don't want it to burden you or hinder you, you know, but, um, you know, if you're, even if you're able to kind of, um, use some, um, use some, a little bit more of a hard eye, but like there are pieces, like you said, pieces of paper or junk mail that may, that you can maybe make a pass and kind of cull those things down. Um, I've recently been helping my family downsize. Um, my grandmother broke her hip. Um, and about four years ago, my grandfather moved in with my aunt. So both of my grandmother and my grandfather, I helped them relocate and, and birthday cards and, and drawings <laughs> and notes and stuff. It's, it's tough. Um, but I didn't need to keep every single piece, right? Like, and so I kind of decided to kind of pull the best, the best of what would represent you know, um, preserving some of the legacy or, or the memory of that and, and really put some intention in that as far as, you know, even getting maybe a, a three ring binder or something that you could slip into, you know, protected sleeves, like a couple of really, um, you know, nice things, uh, that, that you could feel good about keeping and, and maybe you don't need to keep, you know, I mean, some people, it's, it's, it's really hard, you, you know, to go through and, and to get rid of things that belong to someone that you love um, that's not here. And it reminds you of so many things, but I think that if people can be honest with themselves, there are, a, there's, there is a way to kind of, you know, keep the best and let go of some of the stuff that you might've just said yes to out of, well, I didn't know what to do at the time. So I just took it, you know, um, a lot of, it, it, you know, I, I just, I, I encourage people to kind of sit with that, but I'm also, you know, sometimes it, it is that, yes, that's my mom's stuff. And I, it's special to me and I'm keeping it. And that's the end of it. And you put it in a nice box that can't get, you know, uh, water or, or rodents to come in. Cause that's, you know, if you want to keep it, then it needs to be preserved and, and, and call it a day. I mean, right. <laughs> right. Well, I, appreciate, I appreciate that. Okay. And right. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's such a, personal activity, right? I mean, what what I might want to keep may not be what someone else on this call may want to keep in the Absolutely. same scenario, you know, all things Absolutely. being equal. Um, but one thing that I have found in helping me make my decision is you mentioned birthday cards and things like that. It's just taking a picture of them or scanning them, right? Exactly. And then, um, you know, you really don't need the card itself. So Exactly. Yeah. I um, appreciate pictures. that. Pictures are great, you know, and you yeah. can kind of get a good picture of artwork or, or letters or, you know, and, and, and create a photo album and your phone and let it play through. And exactly. exactly. Share <laughs> Thank it. You, you know, you can also share it with other people that way too. So exactly. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for your question. Mm -hmm. David, did you have a second question? I did. Um, uh, and the, the question was for you, um, uh, Teresa, one of the questions I had was if you're selling, uh, let's just say we have you sell our home and, and represent us here. Um, one of the questions I had is, does it make sense to sometimes rent until, you know, rent an apartment or a condo or a townhouse mm -hmm. just to sort of bridge that gap until you find where your ultimate yep. home is going to be? Yeah, I mean, it really depends on your personal preference. I've had many people rent an Airbnb month to month until they found it. Um, I've had people move out of the house because they had so much prep work to do that they couldn't, their day-to-day -day life couldn't be interrupted to live through that. So, you know, they, they wanted the funds from their property. So they moved out for six months uh, into a rental, got the property ready, got it sold. Then they have the funds to go make the transition. Um, but I've also, if maybe you're alluding to not knowing exactly where to go, I've also had clients say, hey, I know I want to move to Phoenix, but I don't know where in Phoenix. So I'm going to move out, go rent in Phoenix for six months while you handle the home sale. 
once we sell it, then we'll have explored neighborhoods a little bit more and might know where we want to go, right? So it really just depends on your scenario. That's something, again, kind of depends on you, your preferences as well as your overall plan. And we can talk through some of those details. Okay, yeah. that's great. Good. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. and, I, go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead, continue. Finish what okay, you David, I, I, I was also uh, set. Uh, Scott, I, I don't have any questions for you right now, but I, I may later on and I have your contact information. Thank you. Hi, uh, <clears throat> my name is Dave. Um, I have a question for Kate. <clears throat> so Kate, um, I have a situation where both my mom and dad have passed and uh, I have this huge collection of large photographs of mom and dad mm. in my grandparents and great grandparents and people that I don't even know because that's uh, that was something that my parents collected. Mm. Uh, not only large photographs that you know hang on the wall, but then in addition, there's all these like older, uh, you know, four by six, three by fives photographs of just uh, you know black and white, really old and so forth. I, you know, frankly, I, I, I just have a, a mental block as far as I can't chuck this out. This is, uh, this, this has meaning, even though I don't even know who the people are. Uh, what do you recommend for a situation like that? Because frankly, when my wife and I pass, my, my children, <laughs> they're going to look at this and they're not going to know anybody. They're just going to probably throw out 90% uh, of this, uh, the photographs. So what, what's your, uh, I mean, what are your, some of your comments and uh, what are your recommendations for my situation? Well, um, first of all, yes, photos, large photos are, um, and especially framed photos, they tend, I mean, the frames alone really add bulk um, to things. Um, if I, I recently spent some time because again, I was helping my grandparents. And um, when my grandmother hurt herself, there was a, a family member, an extended family member, uh, a, a niece had reached out to me and she was very, very much into um, the genealogy of our family. So she shared a lot of really information, really great information. And I, and I went on to Ancestry just cause she perked my um, curiosity. And there was, there was pictures of people's families and histories and stuff like that. And I thought, wow, that's, that's really, really neat to have um, some of that preserved for people's families, if people don't mind that. Um, you know, there as far as photos and and things that are framed and and art to be hung on the walls, like that that are large pictures um, that have been blown up. You know, again, kind of like with David, it's sometimes you can take a picture or like make it smaller and and you know, make it more compact if that's something that you feel like would be important at this time. Um, it's hard to put a value on what people are going to in the future care about or not. But, you know, like I said, I, I, if you have any extended family too, that might be something that you might want to discuss with them. But at a minimum, you could archive it in a digital way and um, and then kind of call it a little bit if, if, if you don't mind um, doing that. I have a hard time throwing away pictures, so that's tough for me, but you know, usually like there's some stuff where you don't know who the people are and um, you, may, you may not feel like you need to keep it, but um, there's, there's a story there that belongs to you and it, it is a hard one. I, I wish that I had better answers, but, um, but like I said, trying to document that maybe in a digital format, um, taking things out of frames, consolidating them into smaller, you know, situations where it's not just a bunch of framed art, like framed, you know, sometimes you get the, the collection and it's just like picture frame after picture frame because your mom or dad put everything in a frame, you know, and so if you took them all out of the frames, then it's just a small stack and it's not so intimidating. Um, but and, and even with the bigger pieces, you know, if it's just one or two, you could even um, take the frame off maybe and, and have all of the pieces, you know, that were the same size or something kind of put in that same one frame so that, you know, that picture on the wall might, might be of mom and dad and a, 
certain great age. And, but behind it was the other 25 pictures that they took every year at Olin Mills. <laughs> you know, like, so, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. And, and as far as, you know, what you're, what you might be saving for your future, if you've got a box of a bunch of things and you don't have any family that could help you figure that out, or might be interested in it, you know, you do have to decide what's, what you feel like you want to invest your time in. And my, my family that, you know, back whenever you could, it's like a picture of a, a tricycle and a, and a sepia field and, you know, nobody's, nobody's names attached to it. It doesn't mean anything. And, you know, those can be easily kind of pitched, but the, the ones where people have had their portraits and stuff taken, it's tough. And some places collect those things, you know, again, if it's, if, if they came from a, a certain era or whatever, you know, some, some museums or other places that do, do like having archived things of families. I mean, it's just, it's really interesting. So I, I, it just depends on what you're, what you would like to do. And I wish I had a better, easier answer for you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Kate. I think that and actually it's very helpful. And the Olin Mills comment is kind of funny. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I, 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 I even had told my own daughter the, the other day, I said, I've got a, like a, 12 by or like a, a 16 by 24 you know picture of me you and dad from 1998 or whatever I'm like it's going away nobody wants to put that on their wall I'm not even centered in it it's just crazy so <laughs> um let's see uh if if if, it, if I can't please I, I just another quick question um this has to deal with just uh husband and wife dynamics uh in my situation you know there's a spectrum of minimalism on one side and then you got clutter on the other side i'm i'm a little bit more of a simpleton minimalist and then my wife uh you know she tends to just co collect items and um and you know she just keeps things around like they're pets when they're not necessary and it's just like uh you know i understand the background you know it's it's, it's fear scarcity she's an immigrant uh she spent time in refugee camps and she was explaining, you get this small little area and you just collect whatever you can. And I, I, I try my best to understand that. But just day to day dynamics, uh, there's just a lot of redundancy. There's just a lot of uh, valuable space in the house that's occupied by just uh, items we don't use for over five years. And it's not only is it just physically un, uh, unappealing, but also it's just a big mental stress. Uh, because I just don't need all this clutter. Uh, I mean, what, what, what do you, uh, from your experience, how do you deal with some of this uh, husband and wife dynamics? What's a good medium? And ultimately, I mean, uh, geez, uh, how do I get my wife to, to kind of see my side, my side and I can understand her, we can have a, a mutual compromise perhaps, but, but ultimately, you know, I'm very biased. I like for her to think like me. <laughs> I, guess I think I'm right. <laughs> and, it, and it does offer a lot more peace and, and, and just a lot more less brain damage and just less mental stress. And I think it's a good way of living. And I, and I would like for her to experience it. So uh, go ahead. What are your comments? Yeah, well, first of all, um, I just want to commend you for being honest about that. And that, that is so common. Um, my husband's an engineer. And um, so whenever we, we moved in together, he had furnished the home, but I brought the decor. And when I pulled up with a 26 foot moving truck after he was like, oh, the house is all set up. He, his mouth hit the ground. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I, we, people do tend to put, um, you know, some some attention into what they're collecting and there is oftentimes a story behind why someone may feel um drawn to that so it's good that you acknowledge that she did come from you know some trauma which that that it complex trauma you know comes out of of living in immigrant camps and stuff like that it's just it's unavoidable um but i think that as a couple um you know, having, having the support of your spouse, um, through a process where you may need to identify, um, some of the stuff that's holding you back is really important. Um, cause you're making, if you're, if you're in a season where you're trying to make a transition, um, those things can be 
holding you back from being able to move forward and, and, and experience and enjoy this next season of your life, having to worry about so much. And so, you know, for, for me, I, I personally, um, have to sit back and, and, and different stages and go, man, okay. Um, I really do have, um, what I need. So like some gratitude as far as like what you have and, and having enough, I mean, um, it really does help, you know, when someone's felt like they've had lack in their past, if, if they can get to a place where they're like, man, yeah, I do feel, I feel very content with, with what's going on. Um, also things that aren't serving you, um, for that next chapter can sometimes be identified, you know, if it was a hobby or if it was, you know, um, a desire to do something with uh, whatever they brought into the home. You know, sometimes people who are crafters or have a lot of um, hobbies or, or, or various things, um, you know, maybe they wanted to entertain or that, you know, but if they're going into a different season and then sometimes it's easy to find um, a way to identify, like, that's not really what we're going to be doing anymore, but it's hard for a husband to, to really be the one to, um, initiate that with the spouse or vice versa. Um, so it's not an uncommon thing. Um, I would definitely recommend, you know, uh, not, not placing a, what your value set on the things are, but I do feel like that is important to realize just a, as a family foundationally that, that people matter more than things. And so, you know, it, it's, fighting over things, whether it's her fighting to keep things or you're fighting to let go of them, you know, um, you love each other, you, you have a life together, you're, you're, you're hoping to move into a future of, of, of a more simplification. And so your time is valuable, your resources are, are valuable as far as um, where you spend your energy. And so kind of emphasizing the positive of those things, instead of, you know, kind of, place, you know, reframing it. So it's not so much of an attack, but like emphasizing how exciting, you know, or it would be, you know, you know, when you go to a, on a, ho to a hotel or you go on a trip and your things aren't there, you know, looking at you, staring at you piles of things to tell you to dust me or, you know, organize this or whatever, there's something very liberating that can take place in that. And then, you know, sometimes you need to almost go on a trip and come back and be like, you know what? I'm, I'm ready. You know, I, I do some of this stuff is, is too much. So I don't know. I'm just, I'm just kind of throwing out a few things It it gets dicey. I, I don't, um, you know, I, I, I like to work with couples one-on-one -on -one whenever it's coming to that, because oftentimes people do start sharing their stories as to why they, they feel like they keep so much or why they hold on to that. And there's a lot of shame and there's a lot of guilt that tends to kind of come out of why I have these things. And then some people are just going to be honest and they're like, I just love it all. And I love things and I love it. And this is my precious. <laughs> so, you know, it really, it really varies, but, um, I would just recommend, you know, just maybe emphasizing the, 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 the exciting, you know, future of having less and, and opening up your time to do more things elsewhere. So I hope that that's helps. great, Kate. I, I appreciate it. I know it's not, a, <laughs> it's not something you can answer in uh, two minutes, uh, but I appreciate you taking a dive into it. Thanks for the you're, suggestions. You're welcome. Thanks, David. Are there any other questions out in the group? I don't see any hands up, so just can I, can, Teresa, can I, I just a real quick question? Uh, and I know that we're at time here, but um, a question for Scott. Um, Scott, thanks for those scenarios and those examples. I appreciate that. Um, a question is, you know, one of the things that Kathy, my wife, and I are, are wrestling with right now financially and making our financial related decision around retiring is, you know, um, pulling from our investments or pulling from Social Security. And I realize we have to look at that in the holistic rather than just that one question. But is that something that you help with as well? Absolutely. Yep. We have a social security calculator. You punch it in. It gives all the options. And the deciding factor is the break-even age on how long you're going to live. Right? So the math is simple. The longer you wait, you get about 8% a year guaranteed. Right? So the break-even is 
how long do you live? For most folks, break even is around 75 or 77. Okay. So, and then you're rolling the dice, right? It's like, hey, do we feel confident that we're going to live past then, or do we want to take it sooner? So we have seen some folks recently, even though the math says wait till 70, wait till your full, full age, they opt to take it sooner for, you know, political uncertainty that, I mean, the Social Security Administration is straight up, hey, we're going to run out of money in 10 years, you know, if we don't right. change something. So, yeah, we can have all, all those conversations, but it comes down to the break even age, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Scott. And so I'll keep that in mind as we start going into that decision making process. Great. Yeah. 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 Thank uh, you. Teresa, I have a quick question for you. Do, do you have rules of thumbs for what capital improvements in homes kind of add the most value? I mean, are there, mm -hmm. I know it's customized, but is there a thought yeah. that, you know, always do a kitchen before a bathroom or don't worry about the carpet? Because I'm thinking if people are a couple years away from that, it's nice to make some of those improvements earlier so they can enjoy it a little bit. So what's yeah, your... yeah. Um, well, first off, I would say I, I sit down with sellers often six months, 12 months or more ahead of time to talk that through specifically to your property. So I'd be happy to do that. But my general rule of thumb in this area is really just doing items that are going to give a huge return on your investment. So that's going to be paint, landscaping and flooring typically sometimes that's cleaning sometimes that's replacing usually kitchens and bathrooms unless they're damaged or have issues we wouldn't touch or we may paint we may paint cabinetry we may paint walls um, we may replace a mirror and a light fixture like really light stuff but typically we don't do a huge bathroom remodel unless it's just necessary from a functioning perspective so we'll, we'll have those um, conversations but I do have many situations where things are not functioning or not, you know, there's, there's been wear and tear that's so significant over the years that it does make sense. So that's where it just comes down to a per personal situation and looking at it and making that decision. Yeah. Good. Hey, uh, Teresa, another question, um, downsizing related, uh, in the scenario where, uh, you know, you have a primary home, it's free and clear. Mm -hmm. and you want to acquire a smaller home mm -hmm. um husband is debt adverse uh wife only wants to move once <laughs> um, i mean the whole, idea, of, <laughs> the whole idea of like going into a rental and then getting the, you know uh selling Got the it. primary taking the proceeds and then then okay. buying a second home you know that's a second move yeah uh, I mean, what do you suggest as far as, uh, um, you know, game plans to kind of satisfy the, the, that criteria? Yeah, I've, I've had several scenarios where, especially if your house is free and clear, that you would tap the equity with a home equity line or something to be able to then make a purchase somewhere. Then um, the loan is on the existing house. And then when you sell that original primary residence, you clear that out, right? So it's just an easy way to transfer some funds. Uh, it depends, of course, where you're going, and it really only works in downsizing situations because of the expenses and the capital gains taxes and things. So that's where Scott can help run numbers, or I also can help do really high-level estimates to get an idea of what the numbers might work. But that's one scenario to minimize the move. You know, the other scenarios talk about temporary moves, and it sounds like your wife's not interested in that. But I would can we um, Scott and I are working with a couple right now that did that exact scenario. They took a home equity line out on their primary, went and purchased their new home and then are making the transition and then going to sell. Uh, was well, is, is there a limit on that um, home equity line of credit? As far, uh, what's the maximum amount typically? Yeah, usually it's about 70% of your equity or so. Um, Scott maybe can comment on that. It also depends on if there's income limitations that can be a factor sometimes too. Yeah, I was going to say 50 to 70% depending mm -hmm. on income. But yeah, it's it's been great for that other client. We didn't tell that story, but it just releases all the pressure of having to find the the having to sell their primary because they had the equity loan so they could take their time buying mm -hmm. and then they didn't need to vacate immediately, right? Mm -hmm. And they didn't even need to worry about rent back, which is a good idea in theory, but you know, 30 to 60 days is another type of pressure. 
So it's Perfect. nice to be able to time the market a little bit on that side and only just pay a little bit of interest on it. Well, yeah. Scott, what's typically the interest rate on a HELOC? It's, I mean, it's not great these days. It's six to seven and a half percent. Okay. But it's just for the time you pull it out, right? Because it's a line. So you right. just pull out what you need for that time. And it's cheaper than renting somewhere it's completely separate. Right. Okay. Right. And deductible. Convenience cost. Right. Yep. Thank you. Any last questions? I would say one other thing, uh, Kate, tell us, give us some hope about clutter. You shared that story about how many pounds of clutter has is like kind of the worst you've dealt with, like put things into perspective for us so we can be inspired. Wow. Um, I had a home uh, in uh, Amadan Valley, Blossom Valley. Um, it was one of my first projects and I, it was a 73 year old woman. She was single, no children ever, um, only living survivor. And she um, had begun to get dementia. So the city had actually come in and they were gonna condemn her property. But this real estate agent that I had met in a networking event contacted me and we were able to get a 30 day window with the city where we were able to help her. Um, she was ready um, to, to, to make a move. So we were able to help her identify some of the things that she wanted to take and um, put her into a, a, um, a assisted living or you know re retirement community and then um, clear the property. Um, she had an extensive amount of, of mail and paperwork that she had collected over the 23 years that she had been in. Her table had about a seven year um, archeological dig of mail that um, we were trying to identify the important papers, but then, purge some of the um the junk mail and stuff i ended up keeping aside anything that was personal but i ended up uh, recycling 1200 pounds of of paper um from her property i took 8000 pounds of clothes to savers for their clothing recycle program because it wasn't really suitable to go into the store but they actually offered that so keeping that again out of the landfill was huge um I've seen a lot. I've, I've moved a lot of, of things for people and I've helped people clear out things. And I tell people I'm, I'm, I'm the quickest diet 24 hours. I can help you lose a thousand pounds. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, everybody has stuff that they've collected. There's the one thing is going to be for certain when I walk into a home, it's going to have, you know, a, people are going to live there with things and um, that's it. I mean, what you come across and what you see just varies. I, 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 no judgment, you know, people, that's their life stories, but I feel like that, you know, even I tell my, I'm not, I'm not a professional organizer because I am, you know, um, Martha Stewart's, you, you know, a protege. Um, it, it's because in 2009, um, I spent about well, the entire year plus the previous year trying to get my home put together to move out of. Um, during a life event that was pretty catastrophic for me. So it made it challenging. I was paralyzed with indecision. I didn't know what to purge. I had young children. Um, I was by myself. I didn't have any help. And so um, I had to make some hard decisions. I liquidated what I could. I kept the things that I wanted to keep in storage. I had to move out of my house and live with a friend for a while. So it was all the elements of this job. And, um, and it, was traumatizing actually, because it was a time that I didn't want to go, but I tell people there's phases sometimes of downsizing. So just depending on where people are at in life right now, you know, you may do a, a first call and you may not be able to let go of, of something else at this season, but you know, you, you realize that in the next five or 10 years, you may want to be passing that piece of whatever on to, you know, a grandchild or a niece or nephew or friend or whoever, um, that could enjoy it. It's nice to me to see people enjoying things that I maybe no longer, um, you know, want to um, want to have in my home, but maybe it goes on to another person who can appreciate it, especially if it's another loved one. So I, I do encourage people if they're able to kind of um, let things go and be used like that, you know, set of dishes or, you know, uh, stuff for entertaining, maybe at a, at another relative's house that might be, you know, more, have more energy to host those things. You know, life is just, um, 
it's it's interesting and and we're we're a consumer uh, you know we're consumer driven uh people we in america especially we love to buy things and and so um you know homes have a lot of stuff and and some of it serves you and some of it burdens you so i i try to go through the mental process of asking me is this thing gonna serve me at this stage of my life or is it a burden and you know and it and, and i'm just a person and you know i i just want to help people um move move into the next phase of their life so that's why i've done these things but it's definitely um it's I have had nothing but success with people though I mean that's the one thing when people do set their mind to to move forward and 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 make some changes it usually happens you know I mean Teresa like you know Scott they've all had people who've come in and and it's been a process that you walk alongside with these people in this journey and and it's been I've I've thoroughly enjoyed every bit of it because people really they do find ways to motivate themselves <laughs> and it's hard, but you know, it can happen. So yeah, nice. Thanks for sharing. So I guess that's offered for both David's. If you think your, you know, garage is bad, 1200 pounds, 1200 <laughs> pounds of uh, paper and 8,000 pounds of clothing. So yeah. Yeah. I was, uh, I was actually going to suggest to David that we could get our pictures all together, the two of us. <laughs> And we could figure out which which ones we want to get rid of. You know what? It's a good idea. Support group. You know? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. And it, you definitely, it's a process and everybody has to go through it differently. But um, sometimes sharing the ideas or hearing the other ways people have gone through it can give you ideas that maybe you hadn't thought of, right? And yeah. like Kate had mentioned previously, thinking of the future and where you want to be and focusing on that helps sometimes get over those hurdles that people are stuck with. Yeah. Absolutely. Every time I wash clothes, I think, why do I have so many clothes? Why do I... <laughs> And it helps me go to my closet and go, you know what? I'm never going to wear that again. And I never want to see that in my dirty clothes hamper again. I keep pulling it off the hanger and it never fits right. And, you know, there's ways that you can kind of coach yourself into like, hey, we're moving forward. We're doing good things. Like, you know, I don't need 47 sets of scissors in this drawer. Like four is enough, you know? Well, Kate, Kate, I think that you said it uh, really well, you know, the litmus test in making those kind of keep or don't keep uh, decisions is really, is it serving you or is it burdening you, right? Mm -hmm. if, if you could take that sort of objective, even on the emotional things, it, it might make that decision making process a little bit easier. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a foundational question for sure. So thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're pretty good. It seems like we've addressed most of the questions. Scott, do you have any closing thoughts you want to share? No, wonderful. Great to meet everyone. Okay. Nice to yeah. meet you, Scott. I just want to say thank you to all three of you. It was very helpful. You're <laughs> we're welcome. We're right in the middle of it right now, as Teresa knows. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, Perfect. So I will follow up with everybody and just with contact information and share the slides. And then if you have any other detailed questions, you're welcome to reach out to us individually so that we can help you if you if you need that. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Thank everybody. you, Teresa. Thanks, Thank Kate. You. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, take care. You Thanks. Bye. Bye. Are you considering selling in the next six or 12 months? Well, let's plan the home prep now to get the highest possible price when you're ready to sell. Many people ask my advice on what they should do to update their home for the best return on investment. To make your property most attractive to today's buyers involves key steps that are constantly changing. I offer a one hour selling consultation to plan your home prep steps. And in this property visit, we will talk about key areas to update now, discuss a calendar plan to meet your schedule, talk about the market today and my projections for your timeline, review an estimated net sheet, and share trusted home prep contractors we work with often. See the link below to schedule your seller consultation appointment. <music>